Uh, I'm Bob Johnson with the National Park Service. I, I work uh, for the Department of Interior part-time on Everglades restoration projects, work for Everglades National Park the rest of the time. And I'm going to talk about water flows and water quality, primarily in Everglades National Park. Uh, hydrologist again like Tom, I'm going to start a little bit north of the park to kind of show you the drivers to the southern part of the system, then I'm going to focus a lot about water flow through the park and explain that basically where you put water into Everglades National Park really matters to both Florida Bay and the Keys. Okay, so going back to the big picture, I don't know if that's very clear to you, but uh, so we get water from two sources as uh, Tom and Billy talked about. We get water that comes down through the Everglades from the Kissimmee, down through Lake Okeechobee, down through the Everglades agricultural area, through the water conservation areas, finally across Tamiami Trail, about 60 miles further south and then into Everglades National Park. And the timing of that flow has drastically changed. Historically, without all the canals, it would take till November for the water to reach Lake Okeechobee. It would take till April or May for the same water to reach the southern end of the system. So the water moves much faster and then there's a lot less of it coming south. So I'm going to talk about those two sources, what sort of comes in along the uh, northern boundary of Everglades National Park right there on Tamiami Trail and then a little bit about what comes in on the eastern boundary where you see that small arrow. That's the inflows into Taylor Slough right here, a little arrow, and it's a small volume. And then the second way, as we mentioned before, is water that comes either down the Gulf or it's entrained by the Gulf flow coming out of Shark Slough and enters Florida Bay over here on the west coast. Okay, now I'm gonna really focus on water deliveries inside Everglades National Park. So with the water management system that we have today, the bulk of the water is flowing over here where you see the blue arrows through Water Conservation Area 3A across Tamim Trail, and then it pretty much finds the west coast uh, estuaries, the Gulf. Historically, the water came through this eastern side of Everglades National Park. The bulk of the flow crossed these uh, levees today and went through what's today Water Conservation Area 3B into what we refer to as Northeast Shark River Slough, and that was the primary area that water flowed. We put about, uh, historically, about 70% of the flow over here, about 30% of the flow over here. Today, about 90% of the flow goes to the west and only about 10% goes to the east. That's the first thing we're trying to fix with some of the restoration projects in the southern part of the system to get water back over to northeast uh, Shark River Slough. And the reason why that matters is because that water from the Everglades can then flow across this area called the Rocky Glades, and it adds to water to Taylor Slough. And as you heard before, the water that enters the central part of Florida Bay from Taylor Slough has the biggest benefit in terms of responses to seagrasses, in terms of responses to recreational fish, everything. As Tom said, if you put a lot of water in over here, you don't get nearly the benefit if you put it in over here. You've got very lush seagrass beds. You've got very good responses over here. So many of our projects, the C-111 Spreader Canal, which came online in 2012, are focused on getting this eastern side of Everglades National Park back. We've built a series of detention areas along here that basically hold the water very high against the park boundary to keep the water in the park so that the water in the park doesn't drain out with the hope that it'll find its way down here into Taylor Slough and flow into the central part of the bay. So a lot of it's about the distribution, moving excess water over here on the eastern side of Florida Bay over to the central part of the bay and then restoring this Shark Slough connection principally across the Rocky Glades and into Taylor Slough. Those are big drivers for the benefits of Florida Bay. And this just shows you some of the flow changes that we're uh, expecting over time. So on the west side over here, western Shark Slough, you can see the existing flows. The red bars are dry season flows. The blue bars are wet season flows. So you can see, again, the bulk of the water passes into the western side. Very little goes into northeast Shark Slough on this side. The first project we're building is called the Modified Water Deliveries Project. It's the project that put the one mile bridge on Tamiami Trail. It raised the rest of the roadway to accommodate an increase of the canal stage of a foot. And then we bought land in the East Everglades, which was all privately owned until the uh, late 1980s, early 1990s. This is a half a billion dollar project. So the, the numbers add up really fast in Everglades restoration. So the Modified Water Deliveries Project primarily redirects existing flows. So you can see what it does is it takes away some of the water that's going into Western Shark Slough and moves it into Northeast Shark Slough. That's its primary goal. It doesn't bring in enough water from upstream that we can really add a lot of water because we can't make up for it. If we take more water out of the conservation areas, we can't make up for it with water from the north end and the conservation areas will dry down at times. So we, the first project is this uh, modified water delivery is just a redirection of flow. The second project that Tom mentioned is the Central Everglades Planning Project. So the Central Everglades Planning Project 
again moves more of the water from west to east, but then it bumps this by adding additional flow from Lake Okeechobee, another 200,000 acre feet of harmful discharges going out the tide through the Clusatchee and St. Lucie is coming south, being treated in the Everglades agricultural area, passing through the water conservation areas, through areas where the canals have been filled in, and then it finds its way down the Tamiami Trail, and we get this huge bump. So modified water deliveries increases flows to this eastern side, it doubles the flows, and then Central Everglades doubles that again. And so it's a significant bump in flows going south into Florida Bay and towards the reef track. Now I want to shift over to talk about uh, water quality and primarily nutrients. And again, uh, the nutrients come from the same source as I mentioned before about how the water flows. So I've got two sets of data. I'll spend a little bit of time explaining it. Here on this side, these are all the freshwater measurements basically in the Everglades. And so I've got the outflows from uh, the stormwater treatment areas that are right in the southern end of the Everglades agricultural area. This is the 57,000 acres of man-made wetlands that were built to basically treat the agricultural runoff before it goes into the Everglades protection area. So that's those outflows. I'm listing total phosphorus and total nitrogen on the same graph, which is pretty much impossible. The units are incredibly different. Uh, phosphorus is in uh, micrograms per liter, and uh, nitrogen is in milligrams per liter. Micrograms are a thousandth of a milligram. So I have to do lots of conversions, but you, all I wanted you to do is see the trend. And so this is the high phosphorus and high nitrogen coming out of the agricultural area. It's knocked way down by the stormwater treatment areas, but it's still relatively high. This is the same condition out in Water Conservation Area 3A, the marsh. And so you can see particularly phosphorus, which is the limiting nutrient in the Everglades, is knocked back to very low concentrations, well below the 10 parts per billion threshold that we consider the imbalance in Everglades marsh. Nitrogen doesn't get assimilated quite as, as quickly, but you can see it's also coming down. And then by the time you get into Everglades National Park, both of them have dropped substantially. And in the center of the park, we're getting five, four or five parts per billion in total phosphorus, background concentrations, maybe some atmospheric stuff coming in, but uh, pretty much what the natural marsh looks like. All the rest of the graphics are water quality in the coastal zone. Uh, these all came from the South Florida Environmental Report, if you're just looking for sources. This all came from the numeric nutrient criteria work for the coastal areas. That's the source of the information. So I start out here on the, uh, for, further up on the southwest coast in San Carlos Bay, which is the outflows coming out of the Fort Myers area, okay? And you can see, again, because it's coming out of developed watersheds, you're seeing a bump in phosphorus. Nitrogen is not too high, but chlorophyll A is up there. And you come down the shelf, you can see there, look at the units. I had to lower the units to show you the bump down there. So a substantial drop in all the nutrients, even chlorophyll A is going down as you work your way down. So the shelf, water quality is getting better. When you get to Florida Bay, particularly nitrogen, there's a bump up in Florida Bay. And it doesn't look like it's coming from the southwest shelf, and it's certainly not coming down through the Everglades. So it looks like there's a local source around the area where the marshes drain into Florida Bay, and I'll show you that in more detail. But you can see just how low the, the readings go along the southwest coast. And then as uh, Billy was telling you, the, later, the readings are really, really low as you get down around the keys, the upper keys, the middle keys, the lower keys. You're down very, very low numbers in both nitrogen and phosphorus and chlorophyll A. So that's the regional pattern of water quality. So now if we zoom into um, water quality in the Florida Bay area, and, and Florida Bay is divided up into a series of basins by the mud banks. And so I, so basically drawn some large basins scattered around uh, the bay. And so you have, you know, northern Florida Bay and, uh, and the east central Florida Bay and central Florida Bay. This is that area that becomes very hypersaline that uh, Tom talked about, west Florida Bay, south Florida Bay. And they're all oriented here. And so here's phosphorus in micrograms per liter, nitrogen in milligrams per liter, and chlorophyll A. And the one you see that jumps off the chart is CL, the coastal lakes. And so we have this local source of nutrients right on the nearshore zone, right upstream of Florida Bay. Well, first, these lakes are surrounded by mangroves, and mangroves are just this massive source of nitrogen in particular. They're, it's the, all of the nutrients that are coming off the mangroves are just decomposing in the soil, and so you have a lot of nutrients locally. The other thing that seems to be happening is as we're seeing sea level rise, these areas are being impacted by saltwater intrusion, and I'll show you a, a detail of that, but this seems to be at least right now, a significant source of nutrients coming into this area of Florida Bay. 
So first I have to talk a little bit about sea level rise, just so uh, I can ground you. And don't look at the squiggly lines. The squiggly lines aren't important. Just look at the trend lines. So the lower blue line is this long-term record for Key West. And so you can see it starts over here in you know, 1913 and goes on. And then the red line is a hydrologic gauge right at the mouth of Shark River Slough. Okay, and in the freshwater marsh, right at the interface between the freshwater and the saltwater. And what you can see is the trend of sea level rise over this long period of time. The general number we talk about is about 2.2 millimeters per year for sea level rise in Key West. There's an interesting bump after about 1953 where it looks like it might be a little bit faster. Uh, just one of those things that's happening. We don't know if it's a trend yet, but... And then look at the trend in water level in the southern end of the marsh. So the southern end of the marsh is basically responding very similar to the sea level rise. The marsh is draining. There's no more fresh water coming in yet at the upstream end, and the downstream end is rising. And so the Everglades is flattening out, and this lower end of Shark Slough is seeing this effect of sea level rise coming into the system. Okay? So remember those numbers, about 2.2, let's call it 2.2 millimeters per year of sea level rise. And then I want to look at an area in the coastal marsh, these coastal lakes right here at the southern end of Everglades National Park, just upstream of Florida Bay, and talk about a, a process that we've been observing for a couple of decades now. And uh, that's the effect of saltwater intruding into the freshwater marshes, usually during storm surges. And what happens is the saltwater causes the freshwater marsh to collapse. The vegetation dies and the nutrients are released when the marsh collapses. And so this is an area, this photo is from over in Cape Sable where there's uh, man-made canals that bring a lot of water into that area. We have similar collapses, but it's on a smaller scale along that coastal lake system. But there's about a foot reduction in the ground elevation in response to salt water coming into that part of the system. And so we're in a bind here. So sea level's rising, and as it's rising, salt water's getting into the marsh. And one of the best things we can do to minimize the effect of sea level rise is build up organic soils. Raise the elevation of the land, okay? Well, here's two measurements of where we're measuring uh, peat increases. One is in the, the southwest part of the Everglades over in Cape Sable in a mangrove zone. And the other was down in those coastal lakes called the Southeast Everglades. And so with about 10 or 11 years worth of data, these are very precise measurements with uh, sediment elevation tables. You set all this instrumentation up and you come back so many months each year and you track it. So these are the rates at which uh, there's vertical accretion of the peat and then subsidence and then an actual change in elevation. And here's sea level rise. Let's call it 2.2. We really need to have enough fresh water to keep building organic soils to keep up with the current rate of sea level rise. Now, I don't know how long we can keep doing that. Sea level is probably going to increase the rate. But the way you do that is you bring more fresh water into the Everglades. The more water you can push down through the system, the more fresh water head you can offset some of that saltwater intrusion, the faster you can build up these peats and the more you can keep from losing them during dry downs. And so that's really our best defense in the Everglades for sea level rise saltwater intrusion is to pass more freshwater flow, really try to get those organic soils moving as fast as possible. And this was a significant factor when the Central Everglades Planning Project was moving through its design phase. They are required now since about 2005 to factor in the effects of sea level rise in terms of benefits to projects. And so this is my last slide. So I just want to tell you kind of where the core thinks we are in this process. The, the diagram on the right is the southern end of the marshes, and this blue is where the shoreline would be, this is kind of a static estimate, where the shoreline would be with a two-foot rise in sea level. And this is where it would be if we restore flow, if we're pushing water down and, and trying to keep, trying to positively maintain a, a freshwater head, this is the same two-foot rise in sea level if we don't move freshwater southward into the Everglades. And what you see is the marsh collapses, saltwater intrudes further and further up into the Everglades, and we lose more and more ground in terms of saltwater intrusion. This is kind of not a worst case scenario in terms of sea level rise, but it's assuming that most of the organic soils disappear over time. Kind of, it's assuming we don't bring freshwater in. So I just want to make that point. The best thing we can do to both minimize the effects of sea level rise is to bring in fresh water. And the best thing we can do to keep from releasing all of the nutrients in this southern end of those marshes down into the coastal systems is to hold those peats in place. 
If you're worried about nutrients, this is an area you have to be very concerned about so because hold, hold, the what's in place? hold the nutrients in place that are in the soils. So hold if the peat. soils, if the peat collapses, all those nutrients get released. Some of the CO2 goes up into the atmosphere and adds to our you know, uh, atmospheric problems, but a lot of the nutrients just get released with the water. And that's what adds to the water clarity problems in the bay working our way downstream. So fresh water flow through the Everglades has got to be a big driver for us, and it's just as important for sustaining development and maintaining our peats as it is for anything else we're doing. And I'll leave it there. Thank you.